Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sujit. I must firstly thank uh, Dr. Sujit and Dr. Yasser Alpert for inviting me to take part in this uh, conference. So I will be sharing with you um, the Sri Lankan perspective on this topic. Uh, so specifically, we had a mass uprising in Sri Lanka uh, about two years back uh, with regard to um, people standing up against the, the existing government at the time. So I'll be speaking uh, regarding that event. Firstly, to give you some background about Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is known as the Ministry of Indian Ocean, located in close proximity to India. And it has a population of 22 million people. And with regard to electricity, the majority is composed of Sinhalese. And in terms of religious background, 70% of the country, uh, the population uh, are Buddhists. But Sri Lanka is a multi ethnic and multi religious nation. Uh, in terms of economic status, Sri Lanka is currently classified as a lower middle income country uh, with a GDP per capita of 3,800 US dollars. Now, Sri Lanka has a very rich and long standing history, a long documented history of more than 2,500 years. And uh, it's highly influenced by Buddhist traditions. However, other cultures and other religions have also played a part in shaping the culture of Sri Lanka. Now, uh, over the last several decades, Sri Lanka has been going through periods of political turmoil. So back in 1970s, uh, riots between uh, ethnic groups in the country started to take place. And that escalated over the years into a civil war. So the civil war in Sri Lanka uh, went on for almost three decades, and that was a very dark and devastating period for Sri Lankans. And uh, during that period itself, there were certain periods of other political disputes. So back in 1988-89, Sri Lanka witnessed another um, political revolution, which ended up in casualties of more than 80,000 people. So uh, this is the backdrop uh, regarding the political context in Sri Lanka, but uh, the immediate antecedents for the mass uprising that occurred, that, uh, that which I'm going to talk to you about, was the economic crisis that ensued in the country after 2019. So let's see what were the immediate antecedents of the economic crisis in Sri Lanka. Uh, we had an unfortunate event where the uh, Easter bombing attacks occurred in 2019, uh, where some terrorists were um, involved in a bombing attack at a church. So that led to a market decline in tourism in the country. I think that on top of the on top of the COVID-19 pandemic led to a decline in the tourism, which was one of the major sources of income to Sri Lanka. Uh, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, itself had a major impact on the economy and stability of the country. Then around the same time, there were a series of um, poor decision making by the government in terms of financial management. Particularly, there was money printing done by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka in spite of advice against it from international authorities. And there were tax cuts also happening at the time. And uh, then another event was the, was the passage of the Anti-Chemical Fertilizer Act by the Parliament, which led to a market decline in production of rice and other crops in the country, which was one of the reasons for the food shortage that occurred subsequently. Now, Sri Lanka has witnessed a lot of corruption posed by politicians and government officials for a long time. So that is that is something that we have been quite frustrated uh, about for the last several decades. So I think that corruption has continued to this date and uh, that may have played a part in the economic crisis as well. So in the background, of course, we knew that globally also we had several adversities uh, taking place, particularly the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 had caused some uh, economic instability throughout the world. Now, if you look at this graph, you can see how the inflation rate in Sri Lanka has gone up remarkably after 2022. 
um, the price of the Sri Lankan rupee went down uh, drastically at that time. Uh, so the government had taken a lot of debts from around the world. So the debt to GDP ratio went up gradually. And actually by 2022, Sri Lanka owed more than 4 billion US dollars to other international organizations and countries, whereas we had only 2.3 billion in reserves to pay that back. So there was a market discrepancy between uh, the debts and the country's productions. Now, uh, as you can see here, again, the inflation of food prices was very remarkable. So food inflation rose to 84% in 2022. People were struggling to survive. People found it difficult to acquire the necessary food and other commodity commodities to survive at that point. I think uh, mostly the people of lower socioeconomic status were affected more gravely. However, people in higher social standing were also affected because of the shortage of food in the country. Now, due to electricity, uh, people, uh, the, uh, the, the authorities started cutting down electricity. So there were days where we had 13 hour blackouts. So that was a very distressing experience. And then again, I think one of the most antagonizing experiences for Sri Lankans was the was the fuel queues. People had to wait in queues to obtain fuel for days at a stretch. So that was a very uh, distressing and antagonizing experience. I think that is one of the tipping points for people to take action against the government. And at around that time, people started leaving the country as well because of the economic difficulties. Um, Healthcare workers, including psychiatrists and other mental health professionals, were leaving. We had a we saw a large number of psychiatrists leaving the country around that time. Okay, so that was the backdrop of the mass uprising. Now I'll describe how that uh, took place. So people from around the country started making protests against the government in smaller groups initially. Then uh, people started gathering different groups coming together. They were not really politically motivated, but their intentions was to raise their voices against uh, the current government and the, the mismanagement done by the government. So mostly these groups are led by young people, but I think the age didn't matter. People from different backgrounds, different cultures, different ethnicities, everybody was coming together because these problems were experienced by people from all backgrounds. Now, the initial protests were quite quiet and silent. Uh, for example, uh, one, uh, one remarkable, one landmark uh, event was the Mirihan protest, which occurred in March, 2022. It started off as a candle, candlelight vigil, but it, it escalated into a violent attack on the president's house. Um, probably by provocation from the government officials as well. So that marked, I think, the, the beginning of the protests uh, at a larger scale. And then a few weeks later, we had another unfortunate incident uh, where uh, bullets were fired at protesters in Rambukkana. So this is actually my hometown. So, so that was quite a shocking experience for me as well, personally because the, the incident that you are seeing here occurred very close to my home. All right, so with that, people were gradually gathering to Colombo, that is the capital, that's the commercial capital of Sri Lanka. And people were coming from all over the country and raising their voices against the government, demanding that the current president or the existing president who was there at the time leave and resign. So this uh, this was uh, this gradually um, built up into what was known as Aragalaya, which in singular means the struggle. So I think uh, gradually the numbers went up. People were coming. Uh, people were storming the streets, and you can see some psychiatrists also taking a stand. And this is one of my uh, teachers who has. Uh, who has raised voice against the government at the time. 
And uh, so towards the end of the protest period, uh, the protesters swarmed the president's house and they were able to oust the president. They were able to force the president to leave and resign from his presidency. So that was a victory, I think, for most for the for the people who who took a stand against the president and the government. However, this victory was in a way short lived because uh, the president was then replaced by the previous prime minister, who then uh, made a crackdown on the protest sites, and that was a disappointing outcome uh, that we had to. We did, that we had to experience. Um, however, I think this this period was very crucial in Sri Lankan history because people finally felt that they could take a stand against the government, against the corruption. Um, so everybody felt connected. People had a purpose, uh, a common purpose um, to engage in. I think that was a very positive experience as well. Now, uh, having said that, I'll explore some of the mental health impacts this had in our context. So, like my uh, uh, previous speakers spoke about the psychological effects in their respective countries, in our country also we saw a rise in mental health problems such as depression and anxiety, um, particularly because of the economic difficulties, the shortage of food, and all those issues that people were struggling with, a depression and anxiety went up. And with regard to the protests and the police attacking people, the government's uh, crackdown, so we saw a trauma-related issues such as post-traumatic stress and acute stress reactions as well. Substance misuse also went up, probably as a method of coping with the psychological distress. I think overall in the community, the psychological distress levels were quite high during that time, which manifested at times through aggression and interpersonal problems. Now, I, we don't really have a lot of statistics to show, but if you look at the suicide rate in Sri Lanka around the time, you can see here in the first graph, the suicide rates have been going up after 2020. So in 2022 and 2023, that is during the economic crisis, the suicide rates have gone up. And you can see in the second graph, the proximal stressors for suicide as reported by the police data in Sri Lanka. So if you look at the blue line, you can see that the suicides attributed to economic problems have gone up over the last few years. So that provides some evidence that uh, the suicide suicides and the psychological problems uh, have been going up during this period in Sri Lanka. Now, the ideological factors, I think it was not confined to the protests. I think it was more to do with the financial problems, food insecurity, shortage of commodities, and barriers to accessing health care. All right. Um, so this is from a systematic review of depression that we did earlier. So just to show you that um, we have previous evidence from Sri Lanka uh, with regard to factors associated with depression, where we saw that financial difficulties and indebtedness, food insecurity, unemployment, access to healthcare are all associated with depression. So we can understand that uh, during the economic crisis and the protest period, uh, these factors would have probably contributed to higher rates of depression and other psychological problems in the community. Now, I must mention some important initiatives made by some mental health professionals. So a group of professionals um, had uh, set up a tent within the protest site itself to provide psychosocial support for people at the protest site. So I think that was a very commendable initiative. So uh, the purpose was to provide psychological first aid to people who came with various mental health problems. I have spoken with the leader of this initiative and he was um, he described how a lot of young people, young vulnerable people presented to share their uh, psychological problems. And uh, uh, however, there were limitations in this approach. I will mention them later. So uh, in preparation for my presentation, I have also surveyed 
about 10 mental health professionals about their insights and their experiences during this period. So I'll share with you some of the things that they have told, uh, they have um, disclosed to me. So, uh, so these mental health professionals were also struggling during this period. So one person said, I was burnt out and depressed myself and found it hard to support or be there for this. I also felt extremely guilty about that. Uh, whereas another person said, the uncertainty and frustration made it difficult to work with clients as I too struggled with the same difficulty. So you can see how the professionals themselves were struggling during that time. Then um, in terms of providing psychological support and treatment, there were problems in addressing the etiological factors. For example, we had patients who had food insecurity and had, having financial difficulties for which we couldn't do much. So uh, we could we prescribe antidepressants, but how, how much effect is that going to have when the person is not having enough food to eat? Okay, so one person said the fact that many issues were rooted in the unavailability of basic needs made it very difficult to support people. Other issues that mental health professionals faced were difficulties in accessing the protest sites because of the police and military barriers, difficulties in referring clients to psychiatric services from the protest sites. Uh, in Sri Lanka, there has always been a lack of liaison between psychiatrists and other mental health professionals like psychologists. So that was one barrier. And of course, the lack of funding and resource allocation to address these mental health needs and the lack of a proper strategic plan uh, was also another issue. Now, having described the negative aspect of it, I would also like to bring up some possible positive effects of this mass of pricing. So again, I'm sharing with you some thoughts shared by mental health professionals. So, someone said it provided a space for people to share their worries, stresses, and feel validated and be visible. Another said that the protests helped channel emotions like anger in an adaptive and powerful manner. One could say that the protest helped people cope. So I think people uh, use that, use this space of protesting as a method to cope with, with all the problems, the economic problems and all the other things that people were sharing at that time. And I think uh, another person said it created the space for minority communities to take part as a collective and share their own experiences. Another said that the, personally, the protests and engaging in the space has made me very hopeful about the collective ability of the population. So I think that is a sentiment that I also can quite uh, relate to. If you look at the long-term effects, I think again, there are, there are negative effects. So the trauma that people went through would definitely have a lasting effect on the community. But again, I think there are positive, there are positives uh, as well. So one thing is people felt hopeful for change because people were able to oust the government. I think people felt hopeful that they can do something about injustice and they can uh, achieve something. And I think it uh, it really materialized in the recent elections in Sri Lanka because uh, Sri Lanka has been mainly uh, governed by the ruling party and opposition for a long time. But this time during the election, we were able to elect somebody else. Um, so that was a positive outcome, I think, of this uprising of people. Finally, people felt a sense of connectedness, and I think people became more res resilient as well. So that may be, um, that can amount to post-traumatic growth as well. Yes, so that brings to the end of my presentation about the